Thank y'all for being with us. So I'm happy to see you guys. Is that I can believe even though I don't see it. 
And there's more, it even says that. There's, there's times about where it mentions that. It says, oh, to those, oh, that you're with me now, but think about those who are not going to see me, who are not going to know me, and, and they're going to believe in me anyway. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you've been saved. So grace is the way that you're saved. Through faith. Grace is the way, but faith is the how. See what I'm saying? It's grace that saves you, but faith is the how it saves you. It's how it saves you. It, or, or, it's the way. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So that anyone that finds salvation has to have faith. And it's not faith that they would normally have on their own, but it's a gift of God that he's allowed you to believe in him. See what that is? It's a gift of God. He's, he's drawing you to him. In Romans, it talks about how in his kindness that he draws men to repentance. And so it's God giving us a gift of faith, and then he's giving us grace. So he's saying, when you have faith in me, I will give you grace to cover up your sin. But you're going to have to believe in me. And so you're only saved by the grace of God, but you're only saved through your faith in God. And so faith, is, what we got to first understand, if we're going to have big faith, is faith is the beginning of salvation. Faith is the beginning. Without faith, salvation is not possible. But it says that the faith to believe in God is a gift. So God gives you the ability to come to Him. I know that's a lot to kind of wrap our minds around right 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 off the bat here but we've got to understand how faith is working itself out in our life um okay let, let me ask a question we got a room here and everybody loves to talk it's, uh, if you were to describe faith to someone how would you do it somebody volunteer tonight and tell me they say okay chris I would describe it in a way. Do you believe in the wind? You can feel it. You can't see it. Faith works in God to like that. Yeah. It's like it's like we've heard probably uh, time and time again. It's like I've never seen the wind, but I've seen the effects of the wind. Okay. Well, anybody else? Uh, how would you describe faith? I mean, this is something. This is this is instrumental in sharing sharing the gospel. Yes, the biggest argument of the non-believer. Yeah. You can't say that. It's, it's to, uh, you can't always explain it, but there's a lot of things that we believe in that has less, a whole lot less importance than this faith. I mean, we believe when we turn the TV on, it's going to come on. And, and I can't tell you how. I can't tell you nothing about how it works. But i got faith that it's going to come on. And that's just how it is with Jesus. I have faith that, that he saved us through grace. Right. Describing faith is like trying to describe gravity to somebody. It's like, we know it's at work, but how, how would I show it to somebody? Yeah. If I tell you, kids, draw a picture of gravity, what are you, you going to do? I mean, it's like asking somebody Jesus' last name. You just kind of scratch your head. You don't know really what to do. But um, So the, what, what we understand first of all is faith is essential to salvation. So if we're going to have big faith, we're going to have to know, we're going to have to have Salvation that comes through by grace through faith. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about tonight is this, is that big faith is costly, not cozy. It's costly, not cozy. You can't conquer from the couch. Yeah, all right, we're, deep, we're diving in. I see some of you laughing already. We're diving in. You can't conquer from the couch. I mean, in, in Christianity today, there are a lot of people who have a lot of good talk, but they don't really have any actions. So we're going to get into that in a little bit too. But it's like, you can't have, you can't say, oh, I have big faith, but never put it to the test. That's like saying I have big muscles, but I never work out. The biggest muscle you have is your mouth. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of what I'm seeing in Christianity is there is a lack of, of faith in motion. It's just faith in talk. And the church is kind of teeter-tottering on, what are we going to do? And, and, and you've got so many boards and committees that are stopping big faith. 
They're stopping big faith because they're saying, oh, we can't spend that money. What if? Oh, we can't go over there because what if? We can't do this over here because what if? And I don't remember Peter asking that question before he stepped out of the boat. So, so I think, you know, we want to be cautious and we're always trying to be conserved. You know, we're trying to conserve God's money. But I think sometimes that's the opposite of what he wants us to do. I think he wants us to let it go and see if he brings it back to us. Inaction really is unbelief. It is. Inaction is unbelief. What you believe, you will do. It will affect what you do or what you don't do. Yeah. Action's just part of it. You know, you can tell when somebody has faith in somebody because if somebody says they're going to do it, you either believe or you don't. You know, think about it. I mean, if somebody says, oh, I'm, I, if you jump off this, man, I'm going to catch you. There's, yeah, you know, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't jump off. <laughs> <laughs> All right? There's some of you that would lay their body out for me. Uh, it's so, faith is usually indicated by what, by what we're willing to do for it. Okay, let me show you this. If you've got your Bible, flip to Matthew Chapter 14, let's start with verse 22. I'll give you a minute to get there. Oh, Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. And then there was Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And now Matthew 14, and we're going to go 22 through 31. And I want you to see this because it's, you, you, you'll catch on here. If you're there, say, I'm there.
I remember one of the sermons I preached when I was uh, trying out here was it was the, the, the cost, the risk, and the reward. And it was little risk, little reward. Big risk, big reward. No risk, no reward. And where did I want to be in my life right there? Even taking a chance over here. It was faith for us. We had no idea what we were doing. Still don't have the time. <laughs> we're faking it really well. <laughs> so so what, what I know is this, is that sometimes you've got to live comfort. And I remember God speaking so clearly to me as I was sitting home and April's like, Matt, do you feel 100% sure that you need to go over there? And I'm like, I don't know anything 100% sure <laughs> other than Jesus, maybe. Uh, but I remember thinking, I can sit here and play it safe where in the boat. Or we can crawl over the edge and we can do something that will not only challenge us, but hopefully it will inspire our children. And that's why we decided to come. It, it was a step of faith. It was like everything we know is over here, but we're going to go over here. And we've been greatly rewarded. <laughs> Y'all don't know how much we love it here. I mean, you don't know how much we love you. You don't know the voice that you filled in our life. And it's the payback of faith. When you do something that you think you can't do, is it brings an increase to your life. And that's what faith is doing. We believe God to do what we can't do. It brings an increase to our life. Joyce Meyer says this. Oh, hold on. There it goes. Joyce Meyer said this. She said, I would rather ask God for something big and get part of it than ask Him for something small and get all of it. Think about that. I would rather shoot for the moon and break the atmosphere than try to climb to the top of the ladder and stand on the top step. I mean, that's the reality of it. I like to go big or go home. That's the story that we've all been told. Everybody who's probably ever done sports, everybody who's ever done anything cool, somebody probably told you it's time to go big or go home. For you guys, you've probably stood on a diving board before and somebody said, go big or go home. And it was right before you slapped the water and your body was red and you did all kind of funny things. It's because you had this, this chance, this opportunity to do something great. And what faith does for us is faith enables the natural man to accomplish the supernatural will of God. All of us are equal until we put God in the mix. <clears throat> it's like you ask me, Matt, can you do this? Matt, can you do that? Matt, can you do this? And I'm probably like, no, I, I, I can't. But if you put God in the mix, then all of a sudden, I have no limits. I have no limits because he, he crosses the divide of what I can do and what I can't do. And I have seen people do supernatural things because they had the great belief that God would allow them to do it. And we're right here with the church right now. We teeter-totter from 80 to 130. And we're sitting here looking at walls that need to be bigger. We, we sit here and we're thinking about it really and truthfully. We can stay right where we're at. And we can, go, we can just keep hitting that lid. Boom, 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 boom. Hitting that lid. And, and, and our... our we can cast the nets wide, and we can build a bigger place. And I'm not just about building, but I am about space, because space means that we got more people coming. And we're not going to get 200 people when we can only seat 140. You get what I'm saying? If we're never going to hit 200 in the building that we're in. We're going to hit 140. Why? Because that's what we set the table for. Sometimes you've got to set your ex expectations high. I want, and I can say that because I live, I've lived through it. We, want, we did it with Edgewood. We were at, I, I got there, we were at 30 people. When I left, you know, you know, 20 years later, we're at 330 people. But at one point, we had a church of, that would feed, that would set 100. And then, you know what, there were people who believed that we could go to the next level. And they started planning out, and they started, they started going after it. And then all of a sudden, that building up on the hill came open. And let me tell you, for a church of 100, it was like a $600,000 note. Isn't that about right, Dad? About 600 dollars on one of the boards. And I'm grateful for what he showed me through that. Um, but that it was, it was. hey, this is going to take a stretch for us. But we can do it. And I remember they voted, and there was people that voted against doing it. And eventually those people left the church. But you know what? Another 200 came. And see, if we cast our nets wide in this community, we can do the same thing. We, but we, we're never going to feed 200 people sitting at a table for 140. And we're not even going to feed 140 regular because they're going to come in and they're going to say, this place is cool. 
And there's going to come a point where we're going to have to look at one another one day. It's going to be elders. It's going to be every member here. And we're going to have to say, am I going to make a gamble that we can really do what we say we can do? And that God can fill the space. And this is not my pitch to build a bigger building, but I do think it is that this right here gets us in the right thinking to do whatever it is that God calls us to do. Because it may be something even wilder than building a building. And I want to make sure that I prepare you for whatever God tells you to do next. So when Peter walks on water, he was able to do something that minutes before was considered impossible. Have you ever had somebody tell you, that's impossible, you can't do that. Do you realize that every record that's ever been broken, somebody told them it was impossible before they did it. Do you realize that, I mean, whoever would have thought that we'd be able to split atoms? I mean, come on. Some of us can't even make a pizza. <laughs> I mean, so, but, but the, everything that's ever been deemed impossible was impossible until it wasn't. And then it was possible. You know, it's just like all these sports records and, and longest drive. Oh, we can, you can only drive that golf ball 250 yards and then somebody hits 300 and then it's a new record. And then it says, oh, you, there's no way you can do this. There's no way you can hold your breath that long. There's no, and then somebody does it. Boom. And all of a sudden, the things that you thought were impossible are now possible. And um, so how many things, like I said, in your life have you deemed impossible just because you've never <coughs> seen or known someone to do them? Think about that. How many things in your life you say, oh, I can't do that? Because you've never seen someone do them. I tell you, it's, it's interesting to me in leadership we see this, is that people who hang out with people who cast big vision, cast big visions. And people who hang out with people who cast small visions, <coughs> cast small visions. It's all about who you hang out with. See, when I'm hanging out with my father-in-law, and I know that he's pastoring a church of 350, it's easy for me to see that vision. Because I know he's been there. I've watched his steps to get there. But if I hang out with somebody who's only been at a church of 50, I'll get, I'll get cornered. I'll get surrounded by doubt. And see, it's good for my father-in-law to go to somebody who's Pastor, a thousand. Because, see, who you're around oftentimes will either increase your faith or decrease your faith. And some of us, we listen to something so long that what was an opinion all of a sudden becomes a fact. <laughs> and, and, and it's just an opinion. So, until Jesus came out of the grave, dominance over death had been deemed impossible. Now we know it's possible, but it's only possible through Him. And see, we're prone to limit our thinking to only what we can accomplish through our own power. Aren't we? That, that's, that, our enemy of, of, of fate is our own perception of what we think we can do. I mean, in the church we hear it all the time. I, I mean, I repeat, oh, but we can't do that. We can't, we, we can't ever cast a vision. We'll never have the money to do that. You're right. Thinking like that, you will never have the money to do that. But if God wants to do it, that's where it changes everything. If God wants to do whatever it is that he's called us to do, He's going to make it possible. It's the same way in your life. You say, oh, I, I, I can only do this. You're right. You can only do that. But when are you going to live within the, within the uh, boundaries of what God can do? See what I'm saying? It's a different mindset. We don't base what we think we can do on our own ability, on our own ability but on the ability of God to do something bigger through us. Uh, Francis Chan, I told this story multiple times. He was making $36,000 a year. He wrote the book Crazy Love. He pastored a mega church, but he, he, he wanted a, a very modest salary. And so he was making $36,000 a year. And he really felt pressed upon him. God told him, said, give away this year $50,000. And he says, okay, I, 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 I want to do this, God, but I've never even made $50,000. So he, but he, he says, we started giving and we started doing things so that we could give more. He said, and I gave away that year $50,000. And he said, so the next year, I get up and God says, give away $100,000. And some of us, we don't even want to give away $100. And, and he's going, give away $100,000. And in our mind right now, I mean, I've never made $100,000. I mean, y'all almost pay me that, but I'm not quite there. <laughs> <laughs> See how funny it is? <laughs> I'll tell you, who's signing that check? <laughs>
And what did we say? We wanted to be here super generous and not worry about it. Super generous and not worry about it. So I just keep giving. What's well, interesting is I'm giving out of this hand. God's putting something in this hand. And it's not for me to stick in my pocket, but for me to give again. And we've seen it. April and I have been so blessed this year. We have seen God do some miraculous things so that we can do miraculous things for others. <laughs> and so what he does, he gives away $50,000. He gives away $100,000. And then the next year, he says, okay, what am I going to do now? And God says, give away a million dollars. All right, God, I don't like your increments here. <laughs> 50000 was a lot. We doubled it. 100000 So the next year, what, 200000 right, God? No, he says, give away a million dollars. The greatest man says, I don't know, but we've done everything else. I'll give away whatever you tell me to give. And he writes this book, Crazy Love, and he says, before, he, he goes to his wife, he says, before we ever draw a dime, we know this book is going to do good. Right now, we're under the microscope. We're, we're getting seen by other people. We're just going to sign that off. And he said, I signed off the rights to that book in a way where I couldn't even get money from it to give my mom if I wanted to. And through that book, they have given over, over a million dollars. And he gave over a million dollars. He went from making $36,000 a year in three years' time and gave away a million dollars. When you can give away a million dollars, let me tell you, your bank account will be dry. <laughs> it won't be. And he doesn't even care about the money. That's what's interesting is when you can give away a million dollars, you're no longer a slave to money. But it starts with giving away one dollar, doesn't it? But no risk, no reward. All right, so Peter, he steps out of the boat. And so all of a sudden, you know, he's doing something that's impossible. What I love about Peter was how fast he was ready to do it. He says, oh, that's you, Jesus. Let me come out there to you. Who else even thinks that way? You know what that meant? That meant that before Peter got in that boat, he had the right way of thinking. He had a different way of thinking than all the other 11 that were with him. We know one of them was corrupt Judas, but all the rest of them were good men who loved Jesus. But he was the only one who thought, I'm going to walk on water as Jesus. He believed Jesus for the supernatural. All right, Mark chapter 9, you don't have to flip there, but Mark chapter 9, there's a boy who is demon-possessed, and his father tells Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. It's almost like Jesus is offended. This is what Jesus says here, go past choice. Mark 9, 23, he says, if you can, so when your kid asks you to do something, oh, if I can. Hold on. Your wife asks you to open something, oh, if I, if I can. And you strut that over there. You know, and you're, you're, you're straining. But he says, if, if, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Christians do not believe this verse. That's right. They don't. Because if we believe that, we would fill up this entire place in 10 minutes. If we really came to the table of every other's meeting, and we said, everything is possible if we believe. What can stop you? If you would make that your motto, there's going to be a way. There's going to be a way we can do it. There's going to, I really have, I, I really believe a lot of times like that. I'm like, oh, we'll figure it out. We'll be able to do it somehow. It'll work out. We'll be able to go. We'll be able to, hey, Stephanie, I mean, come on, you've been with me for a long time. How many times at Elevation have we just thrown an idea out there and said, we're yep. going to do this? Yep. That's how every one <laughs> yeah. of our ideas started. I remember I was talking to a guy, Ken Kennedy is his name, some of you may know him, uh, but Ken told me, he said, we were talking, I said, Ken, I said, I want to put a Bible in every housing project in every home in Aniston. That's 800, somewhere around 840 homes, 815 homes, and, and, and I was like, I, I want to do that. And, I, and in my mind, I was thinking, this is going to be really tough. I said, because it's going to cost me probably... $2,000 to get Bibles. And at the time, $2,000 seemed like a lot of money. And I, and I was like, I don't know, let's just throw it out in front of the people and let's see if they'll give. And so I went out in front of the church and I said, hey, I want to give, a, a, I want to put a Bible in every home in the housing communities in Aniston. And, and I want to go door to door and I want to put them in. And I need about $1,500 to do it. And man, people just got the checkbook out. They started writing. They were giving me money. Left and right, left and right. We bought all the Bibles. And I remember there was a guy at work. His name was Patrick Wilson. Some of you may know him. I know Kevin has met him before. Patrick Wilson, black guy, big guy. And, uh, and, and he, was, he was the IT guy at, at the Cobra training facility. 
And he had a corner office. And I went in his office one day and I shut the door. <laughs> I told him, I said, Patrick, I said, I am a dumb white guy. I have no idea how to reach your community. I didn't, that's exactly what I told him. I was calling him. I said, I have no way how to, I don't know how to reach your community. God's told me to go to Anston. And this is all I know. And we began to weep and cry. And uh, he had grown up in, in, in what they call the bricks. I'm not trying to be trendy. That's just really what he told me it was called. He said, I grew up in the bricks, and, and I can, we can do this. And so I said, well, I, I got the money. I got the Bibles. And he said, well, I'll organize how we're going to do it. We took 30 people. We went door to door through 15 different housing projects in two hours and put a Bible in every home. Two hours, guys. Two hours. It fired the church up so much they said, Let's put a Bible with everywhere between us and Kmart. Every house between Edgewood and Kmart. Let's do it. How can we do it? I said, I know how we can do it. We'll do it like we did the other way. We'll split up into two teams. You'll go down this road. You'll go down this road. And you'll go door to door. Knock on door. Just when we give you a Bible. Thank you. We're from the church. Boom, boom. We did it in 30 minutes. Every home between Edgewood and Kmart in 30 minutes. What can we do here? What can we do? It's possible. Everything is possible for one who believes. When you first do it, let me tell you what's going to be your enemy. The enemy to big faith is doubt. It always is. And the devil likes to put it in our ear that you'll never be able to do that. We did uh, the boys camp for Annas in high school. We wanted to do 100 boys. Thank God God only gave us 50. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's one time that I was glad God didn't let us reach our goal. Uh, we had 100 sign up, but 50 showed up. Thank you, Lord, because it was tough. It's probably one of the hardest things we've ever done. We did a four-day boys' camp. We raised $15,000. I had people coming up. It was about $300. Uh, no, it was $150 a kid. $150 at Western. And, uh, and I had people come up. I, I'll sponsor three. I'll sponsor four. Mark has actually told me a great idea. He said, Matt, come to them. At tax return time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a great idea. And it worked like a charm. We raised like between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars and the school let us come in on the day that they were signing up for school and we got to set up a booth and we just signed kids up to go camp. Boom, boom. School just let us right on in. I like you can do anything with them. And I understand why we're in. <laughs> but what I'm saying is everything really is possible for, for, for one who believes. What do we, we, we do here? We already, we, we've done a hundred Christmas boxes for Christmas. We, you know, that was a big goal for us. We said, well, we want to do a hundred this year. So we did a hundred boxes this year. We did a clothes giveaway. We gave away tons of clothes. We sent a whole bunch back. Everything that we have tried to do, have we not accomplished it? So that makes me think that I'm setting the goals too small. If we can accomplish it, then the goal must have been too small. Go big or go home. Go big or go home. I need a mod, I need a shirt, cornerstone. Go big or go home. But I don't think we go home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love that Jesus almost acts offended. And I wish that's how I would be when people say, Matt, if you can do this, and I don't say, Hi, if I can do this, all things are possible. To him, that believes. I'm going to have such big faith that I inspire you to have big faith. I, I want to run so fast in 2018 that I that all of a sudden you're jumping off your couch and you're running. Because let me tell you, there has been no greater joy in my life than the things that we got to do through outreach. There's been no greater joy. Every, I love the fact that every time that we've thrown out a crazy idea, we've been able to accomplish it. I love that it's even happened here. It's like, oh, we um, I, I mean, I, I'm literally like this, guys. It's not, it's not some great insight that God gives me. I'm at home and I'm like, what would be a good number for boxes? What's crazy? What did we do last year? 17? I know they've done more than that before, but we did 17 last year. I want to do 100 this year. Throw it out there. And then just beat that, beat that drum. 100 boxes, 100 boxes. You saw it. 100 boxes go. It was all over Facebook. 100 boxes go, 100 boxes go, 100 boxes go. We had 101. Because God doesn't just give us enough. You know what he gives us? More than enough. It always happens that way. Every time I've ever raised money, we had money left over. It's because he always gives us more than enough. I've done food drives. I've done clothes drives. I've done blanket drives. And we've always been able to get enough when we needed it. Uh, what, is, what is the enemy to faith, though? It is, what is a dead faith? 
a dead faith. Okay? And this is where we're getting into trouble in, 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 in church now is that we don't have a faith that's alive. And, and I, I know you like my Elvis Nacho <laughs> Libre skull there. I don't mind the 70s. <laughs> 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 this is what we would know. I mean, <laughs> what is a dead faith? And some of you know right where I'm going. James chapter 2, 14 and 15. And I want to run over the next few minutes because I've got... I want to close this the right way because I want to encourage you, but I want you to understand that there's ramifications to dead faith as well. But first of all, what is a dead faith? What does it profit a man, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Haven't you been there before? The guy asks you for five dollars. You got ten in your pocket. It ain't gonna hurt you, but you keep on walking. I know that there's scams out there, but let God work them out. He'll give you the ten back. I promise. Let him work it out. Let him work it out. I'd rather him work it out. If he wants that guy to go over and trip because he took my money, then he'll trip. Me. <laughs> but it ain't for me to curse somebody out of work. It's for me to show Jesus so many. And if we'll act that way and quit getting so easily offended, easily offended, why don't we look at things as, you know what, maybe they don't need the money, but maybe I need the opportunity to give. Maybe it's not about what they don't have. Maybe it's about what I don't have. Maybe it's my lack of faith, not their lack of resource. So, so maybe it's not that they just need money. Oh, they're just begging me for money. I'm gonna, I'm, I've got money. They ain't got money. No, it's maybe that you don't have the faith to give. And so here we go, verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, it does not, if it does not have works, it is dead. Faith without works is dead. And we wonder why churches are dead. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. This is somebody I want to hang out with. This is who I want to be around. Because he says, oh, you want to tell me about your faith? Well, I'll show you my faith by what I do. In other words, I'll go big or go home. I'll put my money where my mouth is because I know where my money comes from. See, I'm not worried about running out of resources when I know who's giving them. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the de demons believe and tremble. I love it. Verse 20. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, uh, by, by works, faith was made perfect. In other words, until Abraham put him on the altar, his faith wasn't made perfect. He didn't have a great faith until he laid his son on the altar. What do you need to lay on the altar? Because I'm telling you, when Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, he laid his greatest possession down. And if you want to worship God and have a great faith, you're going to have to lay your greatest possession down. And God allowed him to take it back up and keep it. But he may not let you take it back up. He may want you to give it. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. A faith that only exists in words is useless and dead. And what good is something that's dead? You ever tried to walk a dead dog? It's entertaining, but it ain't getting anywhere. So think, think about it this way. And you may want to write these couple questions down, but how often does your faith accompany works? How often does your faith accompany works? <coughs> and how often is your faith merely something that you talk about? All right? The next one. Do others see your faith through your works? And do your works prove you are who you say you are? If I can't... I, I, I'm sorry, I do the, I do the look test. When somebody says, oh, I love Jesus, I love this, I watch him for a little while. Because it doesn't take long to find somebody who doesn't. It's their works testify to their faith 
giver and then they look at the tithe, the record you ain't never give? Don't tell me you're generous. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that you're kind. But then when something goes wrong, you're chewing everybody out and you're making it hard on everybody. Don't tell me that because it's going to show. I'd rather you just say, man, I got a terrible mouth. And sometimes I say things that ain't good. And I'll say this. I'll pray for you. Because I got things on my plate too, brother. You know, I mean, I'm not looking for perfect people. I'm looking for people who are going to be honest with themselves, with me, and with God. That's all I want. Just Let's just be honest about it. If you mess up, you mess up. We can move on. We can grow. We can learn from it. All right. I want to show you the last bit of this. And I know i got to hurry because I'm already clicking past time. And I, but I have one more passage. Because what I want you to realize is faith is costly. Let me tell you, you don't set out with a great big goal and somebody not try to step in the middle of it. And faith has cost a lot of people their lives. Let me show you here. Hebrews chapter 11, further down the page, towards the end, 32, starting with verse 32, it says this. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, all of David and Samuel and the prophets, talking about all the things they did that were good, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Through faith they did this. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. That's not like space creatures. That's foreigners. Okay. <laughs> Just to be clear. All right. Verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Now, let's move on to this part. Others, though, were tortured. Tortured. Not accepting deliverance. That they might obtain a better resurrection. You know, they were tortured and they weren't given deliverance. We love the other part. We love the Peter walking on water, but we don't like the Peter upside down hanging on the cross. His faith bought him both things. And this is why people don't take up real faith, because real faith has real consequences. It has real rewards, but it has real consequences as well. When you say you are something, the devil hears that, and he's going to come after you too. But what i got to understand is that my heavenly reward is bigger than my earthly reward. Verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and, and scourgings. Yes, in a chains and in prison. They were stoned. Listen to this one. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. <coughs> of whom the world was not worthy. It says that the world wasn't worthy to even have these people. They were greater than this world. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. There's people right now in basements in China that are praying to Jesus, and if they get caught, they're going to die. And we do good to show up. And then there's people from here that leave to go over there that bring Bibles, and people weep and they cry and they, because they've never had them, but yet we don't open ours and dust them all. And you see, great faith is a great cost, and you can't have great courage to conquer from the couch. Verse 39, and all these, listen to this, all these have obtained a good testimony through faith. They, they, they had a great testimony through faith. They did not receive the promise. On this earth, they didn't see that promise. They had a great testimony of faith, but they never received all the promises of God here. It wasn't their fault, they just didn't see them. It wasn't in God's timing. And so they, they, had, they obtained a good testimony through faith, and they did not receive the promise. So the question is this, as we're wrapping things up tonight, is it possible to have a faith that never costs you anything? No. How do we look at it? Because in America, it's real easy to say we have a faith from right across the country. And I'm not talking about dollars and cents. We may just not realize the price of our non-faith. Right. Because when it's all said and done and we stand before Christ, we'll know mm -hmm. what we did not receive. I, I just, I've been wanting to say this all night. 
won't take but a second, but the story of Peter when he walks out of the boat, and it seems like we miss this a lot of times. Peter had faith, and a lot of us have faith, and we walk out of the boat, and then we start sinking, and some of us drown. But Peter did one thing different. His faith gave him the ability to cry out to the Lord. And that is what you have to remember. That's a part of the story people forget. Even when he started sinking, he knew who to call to. And, I, and, you know, he, there were people that he just said they had no faith. And there were people who said they had great faith. <laughs> and, uh, and he told Peter at that point, he said, you have a little faith. And I feel like a little faith got him a lot further than anybody else. <laughs> when you have enough faith to cry out to Jesus. Yeah. So is it, it's not, we're saying it's not possible to have a faith that never costs you anything. And then the next thing I ask is when is the last time that you exercise your and what I mean by this is if you lift weights and you continue to add weight, your muscles get bigger. And faith is the same way. The more we exercise, the more it grows. And many exercise only with their mouth, thus trying to grow something that is dead. Because when it doesn't have actions, it's dead. So they're talking with their mouth, trying to make it grow, but it's already dead. It's like one of those plants that I have at my house. It's like I, it don't matter how much water I give it now, it's brown and it's dead. And then you will have to exercise your faith. How? Through your actions. Just like you have to exercise your muscles. Through your actions. And so what does it mean? It means that eventually that Peter got out of the camp. And we're in the same place that, that we're going to have to get out of the boat in order to see great faith. And if you want big faith, you've got to start with some faith. No, you know, most people don't go from... I give $5 a week to I give 5000 okay? It just doesn't happen like that. But you are going to have to take increments of increase. If you say, oh, I've been meaning to do this. I've been wanting this, but I've been afraid. Oh, I need to share with my coworker, but I've been afraid. Oh, I need to go over here and talk to my children, but I've been afraid. Take a step in that direction. I think we need to become more afraid of what our lack of faith will cost us instead of what our faith is going to cost us. Yeah, I heard a lot of people talking about you know, with the election and everything, or what what the right way was. You can sort that out with your own self. If you want to talk about what I think, you can, we'll talk about it. But, but I heard a lot of people, you know, they're, they're so quick to dismiss their faith to justify their actions. That's right. And we'll just and, and, and there's a cost to that. There's a cost to that. And like I said, there, it, it was hard. It was a hard line to figure out this time. And, but there were some things that weren't that hard to figure out. Things that I definitely don't believe in. Um, but think about this week. What I want you to do is do not take this word that was given to you and put it in your pocket and forget about it. Grow your faith. Grow it. Grow it. Grow it. Grow it. Start in the word. Grow it. Grow it. Grow it. Grow it. Grow it. Grow it. it is the basis of your salvation. All right? Let me pray for you. God, we love you. Thank you for this night, God. Thank you that we learned a little bit, God, about just beginning to have bigger faith. Um, God, I would love nothing more for us to be the church in town that has the biggest faith, that believes you for the biggest increase, God. I think about Peter in his life, God, and so many times he had great faith, whether it was throwing his nets on the other side of the boat just because you told him to, or it was because he got out of the boat and came to you. Both things yielded increase, God. And I want to be the kind of person, God, and I want this church to be the kind of people, God, that, that believes you for the increase. So, God, increase our faith, God, and increase our, our ability to strive for it, God. And help us to realize that if we're ever going to conquer, we're going to have to get off the couch, Lord. And help it to be real in our minds and real in our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, Chris. I was going to say that I, I like to think of my faith sometimes as like a tree sapling. I gotta grow it, and nurture it, water it, watch over it, give it the sunlight it needs to grow and become stronger, and eventually it will stand on its own. Yeah. And just like anything else, sometimes we look at it and say, "Man, our tree is a little, little sad today." A little right? little <laughs> little <laughs> we help me do this. We help me get this place set back up for the kids. I need to get these chairs out of here.